Hi, I'm Catherine Vesilopoulos. Starting my own venture wasn't easy. After a decade working in the corporate world, I realized that so many things were out of my control, like layoffs and changes in direction. I didn't like the instability. I didn't want that to define my whole career and professional story. And so I left. I started my own company and achieved more than I ever imagined. Now I'm on a mission to share stories from extraordinary entrepreneurs who are changing the world and who never gave up on their vision. This episode, we wanted to do something special. As you can probably tell, there's no guest on the show this week. Instead, we wanted to focus on something that's come up repeatedly in our episodes so far, the importance of family. The team behind the podcast and I have been talking about how often our guests bring up stories about their families. It's almost unanimous, and it's clearly a huge part of the entrepreneurial journey. Our family experiences leave imprints on us as we get older and influence us in ways that we can't always recognize in the moment. It's only when we look back that we realize their impact. So in this episode, we're looking back. You may have already heard some of the stories you're about to hear. We urge you to listen to them again as they're arranged and reflect on your own family while you do so. We promise it's a powerful experience. You can find a full list of the guests featured here, along with links to their full episodes, in the episode description. On Sunday, we'll be releasing a conversational episode where you'll get to hear our thoughts on these stories as well. I'll be joined by our showrunner and consultant CEO, Alex Capellos-Peters, along with show creator and producer, Ethan Lee. We're so excited to share something different with you. Thanks, and enjoy the episode. You started working in the 1960s and you were already a mom and you were working at a time where it wasn't necessarily popular or you were, people were telling you things about the fact that you were a mom and you were also working. Was that difficult for you? Um, that might be an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> there were a few things that were hard. I think one was that um, society wasn't ready for for any kind of change in roles, I guess you'd say between men and women. And I'm married to the same person for 57 years. So he was very self-confident. So if he went to the parent teacher conference and he was the only guy in the room, it didn't bother him. If he ended up doing the food shopping and, you know, helping out, it didn't bother him really. And it was a partnership. And I think he got a lot out of it because the children certainly at that time, you know, saw him, we were, we were um, kind of interchangeable, except for certain things that your kids want to discuss. Some were better for him, some were better for me. The pressure that was external to this um, did not help people asking why, you know, I never did carpools or, you know, things of that sort, which made them feel kind of badly. But I think in general, what it did is it brought us much closer as a family and we were each other's support system. I couldn't have done this without my kids and my husband. And, you know, the kids learned to be very independent so that when they left the house, they were actually a lot more competent to be on their own, which was a gift that I didn't realize. All those years of feeling guilty, I never realized I was actually helping. And it seems to me that it would ground children in some reality that mom or dad aren't always going to do exactly what you expect them to do. And they're human they have priorities and obligations, too. And um, it helps your children grow up in a, in a more realistic way, I guess. I think um, it also lets them know maybe um, that you have to be responsible and accountable for certain things in life. And it's not always convenient. Um, but, you know, I think they're all life lessons. And I've really, I think I'm, you know, grandchildren, well, <laughs> I, the kids have a sign on the wall that it's your gift for not killing your kids, uh, but I think it's more. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think it's more I than that, <laughs> um, and um, you know, I I think that you're more relaxed with your grandchildren, so you know you get to enjoy it more. And I I think some of my greatest joys in my working life too have been to be able to include them in things that I've done. With my family, we would have family meetings. I mean, we would, communication was really at the center of this. 
and I would do things that we would think of together. And one of those things ended up being that when my kids were 10, I took them on a business trip and I did it, uh, used 10 years old because then I could take, had an excuse to take one at a time, knowing the other two would know their time would come. And so we went to Colorado and they saw the Rocky Mountains and they went to work with me. And uh, I think they learned that work was work and uh, they were very proud. In fact, at one point, my son, who's the middle child, I had to give a speech And at the end of the speech, he was like in the front row, he jumped up in his chair and he starts applauding. (laughs) It was was cute, but it was really (laughs) embarrassing too. But, you know, it it really, I think, gave them a sense that uh, I was doing things that people appreciated and were important. And I think it was a good life lesson. Absolutely. You know, when you're a child and someone, an adult takes you on a, on a journey somewhere, if you're at an age where you can remember, like those memories have been formed, you'll never forget that trip ever My parents took us to Greece when we were 11, and I still remember the smells in the village. It's the combination of jasmine trees and goat poop. (laughs) I don't know how else to explain it. (laughs) But you know, that's so true, because when my youngest grandchild was nine, my oldest grandchild was nine, her name's Nina, she she called me and she said, I'm going to be 10 on my next birthday. And it had been 31 years since her mother's 10-year-old trip. And her mother was never the kind of person that would say that was fantastic. (laughs) You know, um, she just (laughs) absorbed it, I guess. And uh, so she said, I'm going to be 10 on my next birthday. I said, well, Nina, that's what happens after you're nine, you know. And she goes, no, it's time for my 10 year old trip. And I was so taken aback that I was I was speechless. And she said, and I can't decide if I want to go to Russia or China. That's because that's where what I was doing at the time. And so um, I said, your mother went to Colorado and she said that times had changed. There are uh, lessons that we learn through our family life that we can then transpose onto work life. And what you were saying about your, your son, does it go full circle from what you experienced with your father working with him? My, my parents had, we lived in a town of 3,000 people. In fact, my school was K through 12 in one building. What I learned from my father is he had kind of the general store in town. So it was like a mini department store, really small, but um, it's where everybody shopped. And there were relationships that were built because my dad, that was before credit cards. You know, my dad did a lot of things on a handshake or we'd have this file with what everybody owed and you'd add to it and then you'd take away from it or whatever. And it wasn't until he died, I think, that this lesson was driven home and maybe I was intuitive. I just took it for granted. But um, people would say, you know, I would never have gotten married if it wasn't for your dad. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, I needed to buy an engagement ring and I had no money. And oh, wow. yeah, things like that. And you just, you know, they bring tears to your eyes because you never realized the power of relationships. And I think that was the most important lesson I learned from my dad because the business was different and hard work. I mean, that business was open six days a week for 12 hours a day. And that's why we all participated in working in the store from the time we could see over the counter. You know, that was an important part of my life, an important part of my uh, experience. So we are a small family. My mom was a single mom uh, growing up, but... Uh, We have a very interesting family in that I grew up in a house with four generations. So it was me and my brother, my mom, uh, my grandparents and my great grandparents in the same house. Uh, You can imagine the diversity of thought in, in that household. So you had people who were born in the 19 early 1900s and then, you know, all the way up to us, me and my brother being born in the 80s. According to my great grandmother, I was not desirable because I was 17 and unmarried. So, you know, it was a completely, I would say, different thought process than what you or I would would think today. Uh, And then obviously, then my grandparents' generation different than my mom, a little bit on the old school side, so different and then us. Uh, So it was interesting to grow up. And then 
uh, my fam, a lot of members of my family have autoimmune conditions. Uh, and my mom eventually uh, got sick and needed a double lung transplant uh, very close to the time that my grandfather also got sick. And so oh they gosh. had quite complex health issues at the same time. I totally relate to what you're saying about the multi-generational. I did the same thing. I grew up in a household with my parents and my grandmother, and they all came here, and I was born here, first generation. And my grandmother, when you consider it, she was born in 1912. And so you're being raised by the mentality of people who lived in another land. They bring all that here to the new world, so to speak. And it forms a very strong bond as well, because that is your nucleus. These are the people that you can rely on the most. Tell me more about your relationship with your mom and your, your granddad and their health struggles as well. Yeah, so, so I would say for me, uh, my mom's a mentor. She was a woman in construction at a time when it was impossible to be a woman in construction. And so I think about my struggles today and they probably pale in comparison to what she went through. And so when I told her I was leaving law to be an entrepreneur, uh, I think she wanted to kill me. I think that was part of, you know, her <laughs> thought process was, are you crazy? Like, no, you're not doing this. Uh, and at the time I didn't understand. And, you know, again, being old school, you know, she maybe didn't want to speak about things openly, like our generation is much more open, I think, than previous generations before us. I think previous generations are more, oh, don't say anything. People don't need to know anything about you, etc. Don't share what's happening at home with others. Yes, yes. that's the, the common theme there. And I think she did a good job raising us, a great job raising us. She's a single mom. We beat all statistics for children of single mothers. And... So I think, well, she did it and like she had a lot less resources, a lot less help. It was a, a lot more difficult time. Really, she was trying to protect me from what she had suffered, but she never communicated that to me. So at, at the time that I left, I was so confused as so why is she bothering me so much? I'm doing the same thing that she did in another field. Like I'm an entrepreneur. She's an entrepreneur. She's my inspiration and she's mad at me. So um, you know, it took a lot of years of reflection to understand that without her communicating that to me. But uh, I always look up to her and I always think, I don't know how she made it at the time she made it. Uh, and so when she got sick, it was a big blow for me. She had stage four sarcoid in her heart and lungs. Uh, and so was on high flow oxygen for quite a long time. And like I said, she ended up needing a transplant. She actually went into respiratory arrest, flatlined, was on life support. And in a lot of ways, a lot of the hospital staff who were with her call her a miracle that from a statistical probability, she shouldn't be alive, but yeah. she is. Uh, my grandfather also had an autoimmune condition. My grandfather was my best friend. I was around him all the time. He would sit with me even in university while I was doing my homework and tell me, oh, I know more than any other lawyer. My brother's a doctor. So any other lawyer, doctor, uh, in Toronto because I read your textbooks. So, but really. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, really, he would sit next to me just for company and fall asleep. But it, it was someone there who I know was supporting me. And so uh, I felt good no matter what, that there, there was somebody there who I knew who cared enough to sit with me while I was up all night studying. And that's a very special relationship with a grandparent who helped raise you. It's completely different than the parental one for sure. They can be your friend. They can have little inside jokes with you and make you feel better when you need that extra support. Yeah, I, I totally agree. My grandfather, like it was unconditional love. It, it didn't matter. My mom was a parent for sure. She was strict and she was a parent and I loved her, but she was like, you know, really strict. My grandfather, while he expected us to behave properly, uh, he would go above and beyond for us. Like he knew I was studying and he would just put food in front of me and it wasn't an expectation that he was going to do that but he knew oh she's going to eat in another three hours so really I should help her now and so it was very very kind soul very kind what did he like in, in his mind did he even care what career you were going to go for I don't no. think so I don't I and I, I don't know that he really understood what we were doing or how or what it meant uh the ins and outs of it but he just wanted us to be happy and for him, he always put the family first. 
no matter how difficult things were or how hard his career was or how hard he worked, he always made time for us and always put the family above all else. And, and that was a lesson that, you know, stuck with me. That and the fact that he worked so hard. Like there was a period of time where he was working three jobs and he would tell us like, you don't skip school and pretend you're sick. You don't call in to get work. Like you have to dedicate yourself and work hard. And that's how you succeed. Not, uh, you know, working hard is the answer. There's no magic here. Yeah. Yes. I would have loved to meet him. He sounds amazing. Yeah. It's right up uh, right up my alley, that hardworking ethic that comes from the previous generations who always woke up and showed up. That's that's what I remember. They woke up and they showed up and they did what they had to do. There was no complaining. They just really worked hard and they showed us by example. Unfortunately, things took a turn with his health and then you saw firsthand what happened in the Canadian healthcare system where you were. And I completely understand that you're not um, complaining about the, the healthcare system because God knows how difficult it was during COVID for everyone to withstand that level of pressure constantly for all the healthcare workers. But you saw stuff and your family went through things. And I want you to tell me more about that experience. Yeah, sure. So, so I always say I love the Canadian healthcare system. At the end of the day, the Canadian healthcare system saved my mom's life. And, you know, I'm treated by the Canadian healthcare system. So is the rest of my family. And I believe in accessible healthcare. So my grandfather's case, uh, I stayed with him during every one of his hospital admissions uh, until COVID. And then COVID hit and I couldn't stay with him. And I obviously got worried. He wasn't a great advocate for himself. English was a second language for him. And while he was fluent, he just didn't understand some medical things. Um, and he wasn't a good communicator when he was in the hospital. So obviously, you know, he's not well. So I would stay in hospital with him and help advocate uh, for him or take care of him. Um, and so when COVID hit, you couldn't visit. But my brother, being a doctor, uh, had access in some ways to some of his charts. And so the doctors at the hospital where he was at were telling us he was fine. And my brother was looking at the charts saying, look, I don't think he's going to make it based on the numbers and stats I'm seeing. Like, we'd like to come see him just in case. When we showed up there, I think I had a meltdown. I'm not going to lie. He uh, didn't even remember me. He didn't know my name. He didn't know anything about me. And a few weeks earlier, you know, we were sitting in the same house talking to each other. So it was a big blow for me. And then what we had discovered is he hadn't been fed or given water or no one brushed his teeth for several days. And so even for my brother as a healthcare professional, I think both of us were really thrown off. Um, and it was really hard for us. And so we got a liter and a half yeah. of water down. And then all of a sudden he remembered me and things were fine. And he was a little bit more conscious of what was happening around him. Uh, but I FaceTimed my mom and I said, Mom, you got to say goodbye because he's not going to make it. It's not it's not going to work here. And, you know, we are not here and we can't help this or fix this week. They're not going to let us stay here. Uh, so I don't see it. And it was the first time I really believed he wasn't going to make it. My grandfather was a, another miracle patient in that he'd be at the brink and somehow make a full recovery the next day. And, you know, people couldn't understand how he kept doing that. Uh, and we all knew it was a matter of time because you can't do that forever. Um, but when I saw him in that moment, I knew. Mm -hmm. I knew. And, and he did pass away a few days later. He was one of the most social people I'm I know. Sorry for your loss. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, he was one of the most social people I know, probably one of the most loved people I know. And so for me, the biggest tragedy was he died alone. He died alone. And for me, that was a tragedy that like there was no one around him when that happened. So uh, really sad. The only thing that sort of gives me some comfort is I think he probably didn't know. He was sick enough that he wasn't fully aware of his surroundings. And so, uh, you know, I hope that he didn't feel alone when he passed. I've done so many random jobs in New York City. And, you know, honestly, I've, I've enjoyed them all, really. And I 
love being an actor. I'm a kids acting coach. Like for me, having multiple income streams and multiple jobs is like, I can't imagine a life without it. But I did feel like I didn't really have anything to ground me in terms of like my professional life. And having Bundle, which is this, even though it's entrepreneurship and it it feels like it can be scary and not consistent, for me, it's probably the most consistent thing in my life. And that consistency, but also balancing it with the fun and getting to do it with my sister, who's also my best friend, was really kind of like, oh, yeah, of course I'm going to do that. (laughs) (laughs) And Cassie, was it uh, the same for you in terms of like, describe what you did before. I think I always knew I wanted to start my own business. I, you know, it was always something I knew, but it, it, it felt so scary. I was working at a bank in spreadsheets all day. While there were a lot of pros to the job, you know, I was stable, I was learning good skills and how to do spreadsheets and financial analysis. There was a part of me that felt such a void. Um, and so, a year or two into that job is when I thought, okay, now is the time to take the plunge. It feels right. I'm definitely more of that type of person. I want to have all my ducks in a row. I want to have a blueprint for how I need to do certain things. And being an entrepreneur, you, you're you literally building the plane as you fly it. And flipping that script for myself, I think, took a lot of time. And I think the only way I was able to do it, frankly, was because of Jackie, who operates differently in the best way, that it's sort of like, especially as an actor, it's like you put yourself out there all the time. Sometimes you book a a role, other times you don't. And it's simply being okay with putting yourself out there, being rejected and, and moving on. And as an entrepreneur, that happens so much. And so for me, I, I've learned a lot. So for me, that, that partnership of having her alongside the journey was really key for me. Amazing. Jackie, what did you learn from your sister? You know, it's the exact opposite of that in the sense that I learned from Cassie what it's like to show up every day and be consistently working towards the same goal and the same vision and essentially the same project. And I think it's so great to see how, for me, the instability in my career as an actor was actually something I always valued and rejection doesn't really bug me and I can kind of shrug it off. But something that is difficult for me is actually consistency and having a set schedule. Cassie and I working together, it's something that she's had a lot of grace and flexibility, but also we found a a, happy medium and a common ground of how we can actually get a consistent schedule and be grounded in that way. So yeah, I've learned a lot from her, but some things I don't want to learn, like how to do our taxes or spreadsheets or anything like that. And she's graciously (laughs) continued to do that (laughs) for us. Oh, she's so nice. (laughs) She is. (laughs) Uh, um, No, it's cool because I, I know that there's a saying that don't get into business with family. And a lot of people swear by that that's their like I will never get into business with family they don't want to deal with it they don't want to muddy the relationship or even lose the relationship so was that ever a concern for you yeah I mean I think you're right Catherine the stakes are higher when you're running a business with your sibling if you're running it with a stranger the business falls apart even the business relationship falls apart it's sort of like it's okay if this one relationship is tarnished but when you're running a business with a sibling Everything is on the line. Um, And so that, of course, for me, it's how do we always maintain our sister relationship and our bond? How do we draw boundaries? Um, If we're going away for, say, a weekend with our cousins, we're cognizant that this is family time and we're not constantly talking about work either. We're we're also building and maintaining our relationship as sisters. and, And for that, finding that balance and the cadence, I think, was really key for our both our sister relationship, but also our relationship as business partners, too. Actually, that's another thing that Cassie's taught me out of I think anyone I've worked with. Cassie does a really great job of um, respecting and modeling how to set healthy boundaries. It's not something I was great at in my life and, and still continuing 
to work on, but Cassie is very good at it. It really gives me such a sense of comfort because I think also in the acting industry and freelance life, boundaries can get really messy. And Cassie has really shown like how you can get a lot of work done, but still be respectful of people's time. And so she left. We'll be back right after this. Jill Salzman can't stop shouting, especially when it comes to business advice. She hosts the Why Are We Shouting podcast, where she tackles the answers to every mom entrepreneur's questions about running a company. Questions like, how can I grow my business without losing my mind? Why can't my kids stop whining when I'm on an important call? Will I ever be able to end a Zoom call without waving goodbye? Above all else, she's certain of one thing. She never knows what she's doing. If you feel like you don't either, head over to jillsalsman.substack.com or look for the Why Are We Shouting podcast wherever you listen. All right, back to the show. The human brain actually gives the way you feel inside your own skin, the way you feel about yourself. The human brain gives you that sense by comparing you to what's around you. So when you hear people say, oh, she's just spending that money because she's trying to keep up with the Joneses, that's just what our brains do. And I remember uh, my mother was a great educator, a great principal, and she was, went to a school in a community. The whole community would change. You know, She'd walk in there and keep my school open for seven days. So I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Then I remember every year she'd do a Christmas thing where she would make her name was Jetty, Jetty Dollars. She'd get lots of donations of toys and everything, and she'd have the shopping event. And let some of the parents, some of them had like nothing, come in and shop and buy toys with these fake dollars. And then there was a giveaway. I think the giveaway was for like $500 or something. And I remember the woman who won the giveaway, you know, they're like, oh, what are you going to do with the money? And the first thing that she did was say, I'm going to go buy my son like a Nintendo or something like that. And of course, everyone was like, oh, horrified. If you think every... (laughs) message from every aspect of society is telling this woman normal kids have this thing normal kids have this thing normal kids have this thing what did she want she just wanted her kid to be normal so if you really understand them you know what's really going on you can look at it from a different perspective and bring compassion into how you look at yourself and how you look at others and that kind of tamps down some of all that judgment Financial stress impacts decision making. So the more you can reduce that and just get to the deeper aspects of yourself where you can see things a little more clearly, the more the better decisions you'll make. Right, right. I have another question for you. The audience can't see you, but I can see you. I see your eyes light up when you talk about certain things. But the question is, what has made you the happiest in all the things that you've done in the last few decades? My son. <gasps> oh, Oh, having my buddy who's getting ready to leave me because he's going to college, but that's okay. Uh, (laughs) That's good news. um, That's very good news. Sometimes we get so caught up in our life situations that we don't realize that the real gift is life, that aliveness, consciousness, and him. Like I went through a period I got laid off. I lost my job at CNN. Three weeks later, my mother passed. Three weeks later, my grandmother passed. And three weeks later, I found out I was pregnant. And then my mother and my grandmother were such big figures within our, I'm an only child, but I come from a big family. And they were such pillars in those families that there was just so much grief and confusion and loss when they passed like that. And um, then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I was pregnant. My son is like my mother from somewhere, but it, it was... The perfection of that, um, the gift of that, you know, is awe is the only word that I can use. And that has continued to be that kind of a gift. And then you see, like, this is nothing about religious beliefs at all. It's just an appropriate word, like resurrection. That's why I was saying get in touch with what you really are 
what human beings really are and all the constant ourselves and our essence and our being and all of these miracles that are just a gift from somewhere that happen in us constantly you know get with that that can manage any money problem you got I am a gender and rural development practitioner and the nonprofit Saji Sapne literally means shared dreams and it's addressing a key problem in India uh, that after 12th standard or after school rural women young rural women don't have real tangible options for professional growth girls are not being raised with the idea that you're going to earn and you're going someone else is going to be dependent on you no no you're raised with an idea that you have to get married and you have to be so good at being daughter in law and that training begins right from you know age 2 and age 3 because you're seeing all the rewards and all the punishments are centered and anchored around you being an amazing daughter in law is that what happened with you in oh. your case did you have that same kind of mentality driven into you oh, no. as, as soon as you were old enough to you know <laughs> yes no not at all i think <laughs> thankfully i mean i cannot thank my parents enough i don't know how did they become so so oh god they were amazing so what they did is i had cross eyes as i was growing up uh, like massive cross eye like one eye looking in one direction the other eye looking in another direction and of course you know children being children they bully you they oh you know you have bad eyes and these are not good and these are not bad so i'd come back and i would fight with my father and i would tell him that get me operated you know like why don't you get me operated a simple operation can fix it and everyone hates me and he would say and that i don't look beautiful and he would say again i think my father and my fa- mother were amazing storytellers so my father would say two things one he would say your eyes are god gift and second he would say he would mention some amazing women's name women leaders name one is like rani lakshmi bai and kiran bedi and he would say look at them people their work is so amazing that people don't even dare to look into their eyes so now i bought these two stories so i i internalized my eyes are gift of nature and i would go to my classrooms and yell back to the you know my classmates this is god's gift i have got god's gift Yeah, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the term self-esteem. I was 5 or 7 and we were back in our uh, native village in Madhupura Bundelkhand. And in our village the rituals of the culture is that women and girls do not attend the wedding procession of the guys in the house. So in Hindu marriages a wedding procession goes from the groom's house to the bride's house usually in a different village and sort of get married there and bring the bride back home. on the wedding card so it was my cousin's wedding it was my first cousin's wedding that i remember and she was my older sister on the wedding cards usually they write each and every man's and boy's name as a welcoming party in the house so we have four siblings and i have an elder brother who's 2 years older than me and his name was on it and my name was not on it and i remember creating a big scene about it that why is my name on, not on it and i go to my mother who is in a veil and is not supposed to talk to men in the household because she is the daughter in law in the household so she nudges me to go and talk to the papa like she didn't stop me she didn't justify it like everyone else did that shut up you know what what do you do i go to my father and my father got like 1000 cards reprinted with a special ra- line written at the end of a wedding card special request our daughter sirviya the welcomes you to this wedding so i became this first person in the entire village to actually get her name on a wedding card and then also go to the all the rituals that are involved in the process and fast forward 20 25 years later my father recently sent me another wedding card from the family this time my niece who is actually 19 and she is getting married and her wedding card which not only mention my name but are also mention like daughter in law's name with their education listed next to their names so you were the pioneer and the trend setter back then <laughs> i think my parents were so i used to joke with my father that either you were like really progressive amazing thinkers or you were just careless parents that you didn't care whatever is happening to your children 
because you just gave us so much freedom you know so my parents what they did is they put us in convent school and we studied in english education or whatever the most prestigious school that was possible in that town and even if that world was very far away from their own education and upbringing they just didn't stop us you know so we tried a lot of new things they just didn't come in the way so a big part of our work is around giving that it's a wider range of exposure both inside and outside like what all is possible for yourself what are your interests what are your thoughts what are your questions for the world what is it that you want to create for the world and for yourself and then of course showing this exposure of you know there are different kinds of people doing all kinds of interesting things but in the beginning that's not the ambition with my students i used two terms like atyachar and bahar atyachar literally means oppression and bahar means spring so there are two ways you can look at the world you can look at in from the lens of oppression what all is wrong with the world that lens is really required and then there is the spring lens what is beautiful right now and what all other flowers that can blossom in the spring at least in last few years i have learned how to channel everything towards the springs all my work springs i live in the world of possibilities for myself and for people in my life now my students and the springs that i see in them is they are very hard working they're very committed they're relentless in many ways and they are just hungry for learning a so big part of it is just channeling that grief and guilt of not knowing my mother as a person into something beautiful like one of the things i remember my mother used to not let us wear sleeveless clothes when we were young i hated my mother for that honestly i i was like she's not forward thinking and she doesn't care what i want after her death my sister and i were sitting and just sitting and chatting and sort of remembering her and i was laughing about Do you remember that how she would like really protest of me wearing sleeveless clothes and that was so weird and my sister who is 6 years older than me and she was much closer to my mother she said the reason she said that is because there had been cases within family someone making sexual advances on the girls she was trying to protect us both of us me and her that moment i felt oh my god i misunderstood my mother to such deep extent like here she is trying to protect me in the way she understood like how can you not feel the rage and the grief of not knowing women in your life enough because the way world is designed i think that's amazing sorry you're making me cry <laughs> yeah, cuz i'm listening making... to the story because yeah. because we don't understand the motivation behind our parents actions sometimes and they're just trying to protect us but when you're young you don't see the predators you don't see you don't. what could potentially go wrong you just believe everyone is good you believe yeah. everyone in your environment is good and think about mm-hmm. it Catherine that she managed to protect my positive world view think about the cost that she paid so that i have an abundant sense of world view because it's so beyond my mind that you could live in the same house where you know that your children are not completely safe what would it like to live like because i never felt it she did and she protected me i feel that i now have so much language about how neuroscience function how our brain functions under traumatic incidences or you know all of that i have the language now My mother did not have that language. My mother did not have that framework. And yet her feminism was so solid. I don't know. I just feel how did this happen? Like I wonder what did my mother think about this world? What politics did she have? I have no idea. And what a loss. I don't know enough about my own creator. I did not know my mother enough. I started interviewing people in her life um who knew her. and i wanted to know more about her and i can stop catherine i don't know why this is so emotional i thought we were going to talk about entrepreneurship <laughs> and instead it's turning into this <laughs> you ask you ask why rage <laughs> it is yeah and the reason i'm going to it's a deep to question talk. it's an important question the rage question is at the root of everything that yeah. moves us to change the world And the reason I'm continuing to talk is because I know if I start crying thinking about my mother this recording is not going to be finished. <laughs> so I'll have to keep talking. I know myself. <laughs> But I I want to hug you. So like right now sister to sister I want to hug you. Yeah. 
Let me go back to that moment where you're applying for about 150 jobs and then you're not hearing from people. And at that moment, did you have this thing inside of you that said, okay, I really do need to succeed. There's this urgency right now. Can you talk a bit more about that? I kept on repeating this thing in my head, which is you just need one. You just need one job, one company, one person to believe in you. You don't have to find you know, a million. You just need to find one. I think that urgency is always in me, Um, you know, growing up as an immigrant with parents who gave up pretty much everything to come to this country, that sense of achievement was instilled in me. And in some ways, you know, the pressure is there because, you know, I didn't really have a safety net figuring out how to navigate the career ecosystem, how to create a resume, how to write a cover letter, all these things, you know, are things that, you know, my parents couldn't share much with me. So I really had to explore by myself. I very much relate to that. Same situation, child of immigrant, did homework by myself, didn't have bedtime stories, didn't have any of that. For me personally, I just felt like I had to make it count. I mean, I had to make sure that my parents felt like, okay, it was worth it for us to come to another country. For me, the pressure was incredible to please them and to make sure that I I did well and that I represented well and made sure I'd never embarrassed my parents. It's a very huge, huge driving force even today. I still want to be able to to impress them with anything that comes up. What you mentioned about making it worth the sacrifices and the sufferings is something that I think about every day. This idea of knowing that they had given up so much, how can I make it worthwhile for our family so that we come out ahead despite the suffering, despite the circumstances? So I grew up and I'm Southeast DC. If you are not familiar with DC, that is one of the most impoverished neighborhoods in the nation capital. And although we did not have much, my mother instilled so much into us that you could not pay for. I just think back at times when I refer to her as a my mayor, when my mayor would take me thrifting. And that started my passion for pre-loved goods. She would take me to thrift stores and give me a dollar or two. And that meant so much to me, (laughs) just having $2 to spend on whatever it is that I wanted. And growing up and now becoming a mother and knowing just how much she sacrificed for those $2, whether it was $5, it meant so much to me to make what seemed to me as just a little bit of money. And um, I I just cannot thank her enough for all that she did for my siblings and I. My mother was an amazing, amazing woman. And I know that's something that a lot of people say about their mothers, but my mother was amazing. I just remember her work ethic. And I remember how no matter what was going on in her life, and now that I am a mother, I am an adult, I don't see how she did it. As a child, so many things I just did not understand. And I look at her strength now and it's unmatched. So there has to be something biological that was just (laughs) passed on to me. I watched her work multiple jobs. I watched her be a mother to not only my siblings and I, but even to her spouses at certain times in our lives. And she did it with such grit and such grace that I still can't process (laughs) just how she was able to do it. I, I cannot recall any time that my mother complained. She always saw the brighter side of things and she always knew that things would get better. Well, she sounds fantastic. Thanks, Mom. (laughs) Yes, I know. And sadly, I just lost her recently. So that has been, yeah, that has been, yeah, it's been a challenge, but I use that strength. And I'm so glad that she was here to see um, some of the evolution of cappuccinos and consignment. I'll never forget one of the things she said to me shortly before passing is that you are the woman I was always afraid to be. Oh, 
Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's an incredible yeah. statement to hear from your mother. I have chills now just repeating that because I know that through her life, just so many times there were things that she wanted to do, but she felt that she couldn't, whether that was internally or just society telling you that you're a mother now, you have to sacrifice your wants and needs to provide for your children. So we came from a family where there had been eight pregnancies and only four surviving children. So my mother lost a baby before me, a baby after me, and another child towards the end of the time that she was able to have children. But the third child to come was Pamela. And she was born with something called spina bifida. She had an open spine. When they tried to close it over in 1956, it created something called water on the brain, hydrocephalus. And uh, Children's Hospital in Philadelphia was a groundbreaking institution that had just taken the design of a shunt, a piece of plastic that they put down the jugular vein to help ward off all of this fluid that would build up on a baby's head. And my sister was one of the first patients in a trial, clinical trial. Oh, wow. Okay. And out of the 13 children that were in her cohort, she was the only one who survived. Wow. So she lived to be 62 years old, going on 63. That's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. And how did that affect your family, the family unit? Well, I would say it to you this way. She was it. She was the focus. She was the heart of the family. It wasn't easy. It was hard. I'm not going to lie, mm -hmm. but I never meant a human being with more moxie than my sister. My sister was friends with Frank Sinatra. Not a joke. <laughs> really? To, yeah, he used to come to Atlantic City to play at the hotels, and he would come to the special school that was there that my sister was in for a while, and she was on the front cover of the charitable night that he sang. They became pen pals until he died. That's amazing. I love this. Yeah. Yeah. She was a pistol. She really was. It sounds like it was a really nice gift to each other. You guys had a, a nice relationship and it brings you closer to the family when one person needs more care than others. And I'm sure your father, your mother, everybody had a shared role as a caregiver as well. And what kind of values did that bring up? Well, it started before that. So if you go back to she was born in 1956. Go back 10 years before, our grandmother bought a house that was owned by two eccentric brothers that was huge. I mean, they used to call it a mansion, but my grandmother was a nurse and she opened a nursing home for people coming back from the war. And so we were kind of steeped in servant leadership and in caregiving as a family. All of her sisters, most of her sisters, my grandmother's sisters were nurses. My mother and dad were both nurses after my dad left the army. So we grew up in this incredible, crazy atmosphere of care. It was just part of the fabric of your family. Yeah. Everybody is in it. And when you were a child, how did you um, watch your parents deal with what was happening in the family? And what values did you adopt from that? My father was a military officer. He landed in South Korea about three days after the armistice was signed, but it was not yet ratified. So he was considered to be a veteran of the war. And that really had an indelible mark on him. Even though the shooting had stopped, he saw the devastation firsthand. And we were raised like we were in his battalion. Now, some people would say that's abusive leadership, you know, or that's an abusive parent. No, not at all. When your parents teach you to make your bed and how to balance a checkbook and how to be, you know, follow the golden rule, I could think that's kind of cool. People come back from war with all sorts in all sorts of states. And um, in your father's case, it sounds like he made the best of it. As children, did you ever ask to hear war stories or this was not something we talked about? No, I mean, we had a taste of it, Catherine. I mean, we lived here in France for about two and a half years. We were part of a group of army officers and battalion members that were 
protecting NATO oil outside of Paris. And then we were assigned for two and a half years to Frankfurt, Germany, just as the Berlin Wall went up. So mm-hmm. you'd be laying in bed at night and the phone would ring and they would practice evacuation. So you had to be ready in 30 minutes with a little suitcase with enough clothes for two days. And an army private would be driving an ambulance with my sisters and I and my mother towards a coast, either the coast of France, the coast of Holland, just in case World War III started. So I didn't have to talk too much about it. We were actually in the middle of it, in a way, in the Cold War. Yeah. Um, Were you ever affected by what your father came back from the war with? No, because the shooting had pretty much stopped at that point. What I was struck by when Dad came home was the incredible relationship he made with the Korean family he lived with. So they ran out of army housing and they were paying Korean families if they had an extra bedroom. And until the day my father died, he was still friendly with the family that he stayed with. We wrote letters back and forth and exchanged gifts for his entire life. He was a great guy. Got out of the service just as Vietnam got really bad because somewhere along the line, he realized that He couldn't leave my mother with four children. You know, I learned so much more about my writing from the other stories that I heard from the individuals in that cohort. And and there were incredible individuals in that cohort, um, like Ingrid Rojas. Um, she just wrote a book about maybe a year or two ago that has won incredible awards. And the professors that I studied under were stellar. So it was honestly more about what was being modeled before me than even about my own work. I learned so much from the other people there. Can you describe maybe what your parents' influence was on your writing and your love of reading? Yeah. You know, uh, a few different things. One, I I think it might have been my mom, but them getting me a library card was, I don't even think they understood how pivotal that would be for me. It gave me a sense of- That's the best as a kid, yes. Yes, it gave me such a sense of agency. And um, they loved that I loved reading, though neither of them, and and I I should say my parents are divorced. And so um, my mom and father divorced when I was very young, one years old. I was actually born in Hawaii. My father was in the military there. My parents got divorced and um, we ended up moving back to Chicago where they're from and my mom remarried. And so I grew up with my mom and my stepdad, um, whom I called dad, and then my sister. So my mom and dad really, neither of them were readers. And so I, I never really saw it modeled, but I had this this deep love of books. Well, my father, whom I um, I spent Sundays with him, he was a big reader, um, but of more technical books. And so like computer software books. And so our kind of bonding thing that we would do together is go to bookstores. That was how we learned to kind of like navigate our relationship, even though we didn't have a ton of time together. And so there was that. And then as I was growing up, my mom and stepdad, um, they really encouraged whatever I wanted to do. And they, I never had the, um, you can't do that, or you have to go for a more practical, lucrative career, that that pressure was never on me because they didn't grow up in that kind of environment. They both grew up um, like very hardworking, just kind of make your own way. And um, then I think that they were just excited for me to um, 
be in an area of knowledge and learning that I loved. So when when they saw my report card that freshman year of college and saw that, you know, chemistry and my other nutrition classes were, were not going so well, um, they told me really quickly that I had to turn things around because they weren't going to pay tuition for for me to <laughs> waste time and party my behind off. Right. And so um, when I switched to an English major, I think they were all just relieved because they knew that was an area that I loved. And then when I went to grad school, my mom was the one who said, someone I know has a daughter who's an intern at Chicago Magazine. You should really, really apply for an internship there. You should, you should, you should. And after her like eighth urging, I finally did. So all along, they have been incredibly supportive of me as a writer. And and when I recently left my full-time professor job a couple of years ago, I was, I was, um, self-conscious about how maybe my mom would feel about that because I knew it was a great sense of pride that I was a professor, given that most of the people in our our family, um, well, none of them had ever been professors. And like I said, like I was the first to go to college. And so when I said, mom, I'm leaving my professor job and I'm starting my own business, I, I didn't know if there would be kind of like a pinch of like let down. And we just talked about it the other day. And she said, I couldn't be more proud that you left something stable in order to follow your heart, essentially. I love that they are um, supportive of the creativity and the imagination that comes with, you know, writing and being in the creative arts and Mm -hmm. that they didn't push you into some business endeavor or anything that didn't, didn't resonate with you. Yeah, and I I think that because um, my mom, my dad, and my father, they all kind of had to um, follow a non-conventional path, or they at least all chose to follow a kind of non-conventional path. So I think that's why they had more tolerance for it. So my mom went from being a bank teller to a bank manager and then left that and now um, is a mas- massage therapist at a hospital and and helps women basically like rehabilitate after they've given birth. It's a job she loves, loves, loves. And um, when I was going into grad school, my dad um, was basically taking night classes to get a bachelor's degree. And then my biological father, he did a bunch of night classes and then got a million different kinds of certificates. And uh, he his focus was kind of software and um, a lot of work with computers. But it's like each of them had to make their own way without having any models because um, my grandparents, all of them on on all sides were really like blue collar workers, truck drivers. Um, My grandfather, other grandfather worked for the railroad. And uh, so none of my parents had this road modeled for them and they had to go their own way. And so I think they encouraged that. It sounds like there's a lot of determination involved in taking your your fate in your own hands it it just shows that you don't stay in the same place for too long if that's not what makes you happy Your, your family has that thread in it i think based on what you're telling me and so do you find that you also have that ability to change directions to take decisions or to make decisions quickly um in order to to satisfy what's happening in your life at at any given moment yeah i i think what I've learned is that nothing has to be permanent. You can change your situational setup. Uh, You don't have to stay in something that makes you unhappy, even if it's a great thing. And even if it's something that you worked really, really hard at, leaving it doesn't have to mean failure. It doesn't have to mean anything. It means that it was a period of your life that was successful and satisfying for what it was. And then 
you changed and it changed and it was time to move on to something else. So it helped erase this stigma around leaving. Mm -hmm. Truly, I think that's really what it is, is that there wasn't a sense of, oh, if you don't stick this out, then there's failure or you're betraying the industry or or what have you. Um, So it was that. It was a fostering a trust in myself. Um, They modeled that for sure about how do we take leaps that might seem impractical to other people. And they were all um, very innovative. Like we didn't come from means. And yet if my grandmother would always say, when there's a will, there's a way. And if you want something, you figure out a way to make it happen. Like when money was tight, right? If you grew out of your winter boots and you didn't have new winter boots, then what you do is you put plastic bags over your socked foot and then you put that foot into a gym shoe and now it's a waterproof shoe. (laughs) (laughs) It's just stuff like that. You, You make it happen. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed these stories, we would love it if you could please rate, review, and subscribe to And So She Left wherever you listen. Your feedback helps us to better serve current listeners and reach new ones. To make it even easier, we're launching a quick feedback form. It's just five questions long, and it would help us immensely if you could please take a few minutes to fill it out. Your responses directly impact the creation of the show, and we want to make the show that you want to hear. And So She Left is made by Consulta and Ethan Lee. We'll be back on Sunday for a discussion about family, and next Wednesday with a new episode. Our music is by Chris Zabriskie, edited for your enjoyment. You can find a list of all the songs you heard here in the episode notes. I'm Catherine Vasilopoulos, and thanks for listening.